Over the last decade, my work as an investigative journalist and filmmaker has taken me across the world, documenting subjects like elephant trafficking in India, marine contraband pipelines in China, labor abuses in the Middle East, and the poaching of endangered species globally. And then I came across this article on the internet that made me question everything. With every film I've made about environmental crime for television, I'm realizing I've always focused on the small players in the system. And so over the last few years, I've been looking into the role of extractive big business. And with each part of my investigation, I get a deeper look into how insidious and outsize the corporate footprint on our planet is. None of these plants in your area. Gosh, that's almost like a legal loop. Colonization of cacao. Is that a bulletproof vest? Who is responsible for the toxic world we live in? And who are the people most impacted? This might be your hardest story to tell, but it's one I can't ignore. Please welcome to the stage Malaika Vaz, co-founder and CEO of Untamed Planet, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja. <laughs> so I was just saying really briefly, because I don't want to eat into the time, Untamed on the website describes itself as a media company, production company, that works to use storytelling to protect nature. Can you just talk about Malaika, first of all, what you were seeing in the production landscape that you thought, I need to come in here and tell these stories that I'm telling? Thanks, Jen. Well, I think, you know, very often when it comes to telling stories about the climate crisis, we report about incidents in moments, you know, when there's a hurricane, when there's a flood, when we're at a global climate convention. But I think it's so critical to make sure that we keep that momentum going long after those breaking points. So as a company that produces documentaries and TV shows for networks like National Geographic and the BBC, our goal really is to tell stories that can help people to understand what the front lines look like and what the solutions are that can make that transformative difference. Talk about that, because that was, again, a taste of what you've been doing. You have been traveling all over the world. The past few days, you've been in how many countries? <laughs> well, I was in Borneo right before this, and I'm heading to Madagascar and Sri Lanka after. So. And tell them what the rest of your year looks like. <laughs> tell them. A couple of most spots uh, on the trail. Yeah. Um, we're working on a lion film uh, very soon, and a couple of other projects in the climate space and in the conservation space. So lots of jumping up in here. But I think, honestly, it's, you know, for us, more than the travel and the wildlife, it is about what we learn from the communities. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest joys of the work that I do is I get to spend time with frontline communities across the world who are doing such an amazing job protecting the natural world. And more than anything, I've realized that, you know, the way that they view the natural world, their form of stewardship, which is deeply rooted in indigenous wisdom, as opposed to this extractivist, neo-colonial way of thinking about the planet, I think there's so much to learn about it. And, you know, often we have this idea of the noble savage who is out there protecting the wild because they're so different from us because they have different philosophies. But when you spend time with these incredible, incredible intelligent people across the world, you realize that actually so much of it is self-serving as well. They're not doing it only for altruistic perspectives and reasons. They're doing it because they know that we all benefit from a healthy planet. We all benefit from a planet where nature is protected. And an example is we filmed with communities who basically protect mangroves. And the reason they do that is because they know that by protecting the mangroves, they can have healthy spawning grounds for fish, which helps them to build a resilient economy. And I think that's so relevant to us because because you know, outside of these rooms, people often have this misconception that protecting nature is something that requires sacrifice, that requires loss. But I think you know, with the cost of renewables going down very, very fast, and with 
fossil fuels remaining incredibly expensive, and that's not even counting the environmental cost. We're seeing that actually protecting nature makes so much business sense, and I think storytelling now is adapting to tell that story. And I think as, as a company, we're so excited about telling stories of solutions mm -hmm. and communities um, and people who are truly changing the game by prioritizing nature for self-interested reasons as well. It's the most incredible thing we can do for public health, for our economy, for everything that matters to us. And you were telling me, uh, and again, that was a teaser to your film that's coming out early in 2024, but you were telling me that you really wanted to, with this film, shift from just focusing on really what uh, a lot of documentaries have focused on, which is the majestic part of nature, and instead focus on big industry and the role that big industry has played. Um, can you talk about that and, and yeah. how you were able to make that shift? Well, so this documentary was funded by National Geographic Society, and it's about big oil, plastic, fast fashion, and coal, four of the biggest industries that are having the largest footprint on our planet. And when my team and I were looking into the places with the highest levels of pollution, what we found is that where you see the most pollution and it's not a coincidence, happens to be areas that have always been inhabited by communities of color, by vulnerable communities. And you know, historical inequity and modern day inequity are so inextricably linked. One of the locations that we filmed in Baton Rouge in Louisiana, where you were born, yes, is that I was right? Born. I was born, I was telling her this. She didn't yeah. just guess that. <laughs> she told me earlier. Um, but Baton Rouge, as an example, that area in Louisiana is called Cancer Alley because of the highest rates of, some of the highest rates of cancer in the United States. It's where you see some of the biggest oil and gas plants in the United States. Um, but it also, it's all land that is owned by African-American communities for the most part. And I met someone who told me that where there used to be plantations, there are plants today and nothing has changed. Those communities are still facing the same issues in many ways, just with a different name that their ancestors did. And I think for us, it's really important to talk about those hard stories about how climate change and environmental damage has a direct impact on communities across the world. What's the challenge in doing that? Because we, of course, know that the, the big industries have a, a lot of their own interests and a, a lot of their own lobbyists, right? So, so coming in as a documentarian, whether it's in the States or you know, across the world, I mean, what is the challenge that, that you face oftentimes? Well, you know, we've done a lot of filming which requires us going undercover and you know, China, in Hong Kong, in different parts of Asia, in the United States. And I think there's obviously a risk, but I do have the privilege of leaving. So, you know, we go in there as a crew, we tell the story and then we leave. Um, but for us, what's most important is making sure that the local communities that we work with are field producers and, you know, cinematographers who are from that landscape are actually well protected. But I think with this film, you know, beyond telling the story of communities, one of the challenges was that we were talking about big industry and that's not easy to do when you're calling out not just, you know, the corporations, but rather the systems that allow these corporations to continue business as usual. And so what we did was we followed the money and we realized that the system is not broken. It is 100% built that way. It, there are so many multinational corporations and governments that are benefiting so deeply from the destruction of our planet. I mean, take the example of fossil fuel subsidies. We have a long history of government intervention in energy markets across the world. And for a lot of recent history, it's been important to have that. But right now, as we have this massive green transition, I think having equal amounts of investment is so, so critical. And telling the story of why that's so important is more exciting than any other thing that we've taken on in the last couple of years. Are you seeing, are you seeing it getting the right amount of attention, though, that you would like to see, that you would like for it to, be, to get? Well, you know, when I first started my career, I remember the the word conservation was called the C word in a meeting with the network executive. Um, but I think increasingly with streamers and television networks, also because of the state of our planet, but I think you know, these companies are more excited and more ready to take a risk to tell these stories, but it's still so much harder. I mean, if you think about it, um, 
I think climate change has a massive PR problem because we aren't able to get people to care about nature in the way that we care about other things. When the Notre Dame Cathedral had the catastrophe that it did, you had images and videos in a couple of minutes and you had huge amounts of funding coming in. When you know we all experienced the COVID pandemic, there was a lot that could have been done better, but the amount of rapid deployment of vaccines that we saw, like the urgency was incredible. I often wonder why we don't have that level of urgency with the climate crisis. And the reason is because we attach value to history. We attach value to religion. We attach value to public health. But for the most part, it is a real challenge, and I think an interesting one for film companies and production houses to tru truly tell stories that prioritize nature and that help people fall in love with nature. And I think so much of it is also about mainstreaming it, you know, kind of stepping away from this hipster disdain that we have sometimes for popularity and mass media um, and realizing that we have to make programming that isn't just nuanced, but it's also deeply entertaining. And I have a tiny trailer to something that we worked on that I think is a fun watch that I'd love to play. From the Arctic to the tropics, and rivers to rainforests. Get closer to islands bursting with life. Travel through sea, land, and air to uncover unique and diverse habitats where wildlife fights to survive. It's incredible. Tell us about that. Well, so a large part of our work is telling stories about the natural world, stories of animals, which is very different from what you saw earlier with the climate yeah. change storytelling. But I think both are equally important because in different ways, you're bringing in that hope and that optimism that's so crucial. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we need to have the urgency that's required. So I think for us as a company, balancing those two very different kinds of storytelling is really, really critical. And I would say that, you know, with telling stories about nature, one thing that I found is that it helps to unite. You know, hmm. we do need bipartisan support for all climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts. We need people across the political spectrum to care deeply about nature. And one way to do that is to tell people that, you know, we have this incredible natural heritage. We get to live with modern day dinosaurs, essentially, and we have the opportunity to protect that. Um, I would like for, you know, media ecosystems across the world to make it easier to tell stories of, you know, climate change and inequity, but I think, you know, it's still early days and we have a lot of work to do. But right now, telling stories Stories like that is definitely easier than what you saw earlier. Well, what is the challenge then still? I mean, what what is, you mentioned the C word that you used to get sometimes in meetings. What is it that you hear? Where is the pushback still? Well, often there's this idea that after a long day of work, people don't want to come home and hear about, you know, how climate change is impacting Bangladesh. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we have as a challenge, which is how do you tell these stories, but in a way that makes people feel optimistic, in a way that makes people feel like there is hope, but also we need to have action at the scale that, you know, is required at this point in history. When you look at the storytelling that surrounded the fossil fuel expansion and scaling up process, there was you know, so much programming that people were being exposed to that told them that this is the best way for government, for taxpayer money to be used. I think right now we're seeing you know, much, much less funding going towards the green transition. I mean, I'm very excited about the developments in the last couple of days with the operationalization of the loss and damage fund and the Altera fund being announced. But I think we have a long way to go. Mm. And unless we have large players like the United States, like India, mm. both countries that I call home, really stepping up and choosing to take decisive action not just in terms of what we're saying and what we're communicating, but also in terms of the financing that's on the table. I think, you know, we have a long way to go. Do you find that there is space when you do have a story like what, you know, you're producing right now? It, considering the media landscape right now, do you, do you find that there is space or do you think there needs to be more room for these types of stories? Well, I think there's definitely space, and I think there's so many filmmakers that I know uh, within the National Geographic ecosystem, within the BBC, with other companies who are telling these stories. I think that one thing that 
we're really excited about as a company is making sure that we tell these stories in partnership with communities. We make sure that you know our producers in the field and our cinematographers and our editors really represent the communities that these stories are being told from as well. Um, I think you know going back to something that my friend Noel Cox says, he often says. You know, if you want to change the story, change the storyteller. And I think that makes such a difference. Having diverse perspectives represented in the editorial process helps you to tell stories that are so much more nuanced, that can truly change things at not just the grassroots level, but at the global level. And I wonder too, I mean, just bringing it back to the community, what is, what is the response that you sometimes get when you're working with a lot of local communities? Do they get to see the film? Do they, you know, how do they feel when they see some of the work that you're doing? I think that's a great question because the best compliment I've ever received is when we did this series about big cats for National Geographic. And when the series came out, um, I went back to the community for another project and I was hanging out with them over dinner and they said, we've never been represented in a way that made us so happy. And I felt like that, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're winning awards or whether you have these big, exciting premieres on TV, but if the communities feel happy with the way that their story is represented, when they see themselves as the heroes that they are protecting nature on the front lines, that's where I think truly change happens. And I mean, with every film that we do, we make sure that when the edit's just about to go out, we have those community voices reviewing the edit, giving us feedback, changing things with us, because so often we have this very didactic view of storytelling. But if we are to truly create participatory documentaries that can change perspectives at a global scale, we have to make sure that we aren't just going in there telling a story that is based on me and my team's perspective, but is truly representative of what's happening at the grassroots level. And that's not to say that there isn't room for the big players, right? It, it sure. sort of needs to be everyone working together. Would you say that? A hundred percent. And I think the big players are coming in and telling those stories. I think, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to the TV networks that my company gets to produce for because they are looking for those nuanced stories. They are looking for that incisive journalism that really is underpinning all of our efforts. And I think it's a really really exciting time because we have this massive challenge ahead of us. How do we communicate the climate crisis in a way that can appeal to everyone's worldview? How can we communicate the climate crisis in a way that helps us to actually have action beyond events like COP28? Like, how do we actually go back home from this and make sure that at the domestic level, we're seeing the, the actions that need to be taken actually being taken? And people can play it and play it again and go back and share it. Um, Malika, what's next for you? I mean, talk to us a little bit about the film that's coming out next year uh, and also sort of what's in the pipeline for 2024. Well, we have a couple of projects that, you know, we've been working on in 2023 and a couple that are slated in 2024. And I think, you know, they are across a wide spectrum. But for us, I think what's been really exciting at Untamed Planet is that we've diversified from telling only stories about wildlife to telling stories about the economy and politics and nature because Nature conservation isn't a beat. Wildlife conservation, climate change is not a political beat that you know you report on on Fridays. It has to be central to everything that we do as the media. It has to be central to every single story that's out there. And when I think about this week, you know, it reminds me of how important storytelling is because the groundwork is laid in the 12 months that happens in between COP. Um, I think there's a huge amount of mobilization that's required between these events because when governments come to the table, the way that they can contribute in terms of their NDCs or in terms of the way that they contribute to funds like the Just Energy Transition Partnership, it is completely based on what their electorate would allow them to do and what you know they can get away with, so to speak. Um, and I think storytelling really comes in there because if you are able to appeal to the hearts and minds of people, help them realize that combating the climate crisis is in everyone's interest. It makes it so much easier to be at global conventions like now and make sure that we're actually taking the steps that were, are required. So for us as a company at Untamed Planet, we're so stoked about telling more stories about climate, about nature, and about the economy. And finally, I mean, how do you do it in places where it's in, in some cases banned, right? Because there's some parts of the world where you know, you're not allowed to, to do a lot of the, the storytelling or the, spread the messaging that, that you guys are, are trying to. I mean, what, what's your guidance on that? 
Well, I think it's critical to get these stories out in G20 countries. I mean, you know, that's where a lot of our emissions are coming from. Um, having said that, though, you're completely right. There is a lot of opposition to telling the difficult stories. And I think sometimes it starts with, you know, doing 10% of the story that you want and then get to 20% and 30% and you know appealing to different audiences with different stories I think is really critical when we're making a film that is aimed at reaching a hundred countries and millions of people the kind of scale that we're looking at and the kind of tone of the film that we're looking at is so different than if we're targeting policymakers. So I'm a big advocate for contextual storytelling that it can appeal to the mindset and the values and the vision of a country or of a people. You're amazing. Malaika Bez, thank you so much. Please, thank everyone, you. check out her film early in 2024, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.